I'm going to uh, just give you a little introduction for the day. So welcome to the shared space and spiritual company for the single day. We'll start soon uh, with a Dharma talk and a guided meditation by Ajahn Brahm. And then we'll finish at five o'clock today. But in between, you will be having your lunch break and hopefully there'll be enough time to rest a little bit as well. And of course, there'll be tea breaks factored in. So the schedule is deliberately designed to be spacious, to allow for plenty of personal practice time and rest. So see if you can find your own personal supportive and nourishing rhythm for the day. And yes, full-time attendance is necessary for this. It is a full retreat. Uh, we might not be full this morning, but if, if there are any sort of no-shows, we'll be inviting waitlisted people later. So I do ask that to make the best of this opportunity, you um, attend everything. And because we always end with meta and, you know, there's just a nice closure to the day. So if you haven't practiced before in your own home, it can be a rewarding experience because you're taking uh, time out of your ordinary lives to carve a retreat space in your own home. And I found this really, really helpful in being able to bring my meditation practice into my everyday life. So we ask that you treat this Zoom room the way you would treat a Dhamma hall. So even though it is your personal space, we ask that you work as if you're alone, first of all, like if there are other people in the house, try to sort of um, remind them that you're on retreat and, and that this is your little cocoon for the day. Um, you could choose to have your screen on gallery view if you want to see everybody's face or on speaker view if you only want to see the teacher. So just find out what feels supportive to you. Sometimes it's nice to feel that we're all here together. Other times it's more of a distraction and you just want to really listen to the Dhamma talk. And also, you know, sometimes you might find you're just staring into the screen. I find I do that. And it can be helpful just to withdraw a little bit, get back into your body and close your eyes and just allow the retreat to happen as it would in a Dhamma hall. So we also ask that you maintain noble silence during this retreat as far as you possibly can. So that means that um, we won't be using the chat box. So again, just as in the Dhamma hall, you wouldn't be talking to each other. We won't be using the chat box um, until the question and answer session. And during the question and answer sessions with Ajahn and with myself, you'll be typing them in, sending them to Derek. That's why he has this unusual name, Q&A Derek. That's not his real name, but for today, <laughs> he'll be uh, receiving the questions and then sending them to me. So that just makes my life easy too. I only get the questions at the right time during the day. And uh, I'll read them out to Ajahn Brown. So all the questions will be anonymous um, for your own privacy. And we ask that you keep them concise and related to your meditation practice and no more than one question per person if possible because we do have a big group and I don't think we can probably get to everybody's question but we really want to try our best so see if there's something very pertinent and very important and put that one in and again keeping it as concise as you can please um anything else and yes just that noble silence also means silence in terms of communicating through emails or mobile phone messages so if you can it can be very supportive to put all that down just for the day in the past you know there were never such things in meditation centers you're in a center and you know if you're in a monastery or a meditation center you wouldn't see i don't think they had mobile phones but you certainly wouldn't be doing emails for months at a time and i sometimes think it's a shame that we never get that experience in life anymore in modern life so See if you can offer yourself that experience today because it really does help to collect and quieten the mind. So I think that's everything, but I'll give you an opportunity quickly if anyone has a question uh, to, I guess you'd have to raise your hand and then you'd be recorded. So <laughs> not the best opportunity. Hopefully it's clear. You all look fairly okay. So I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Ajahn Brahm. It is, of course, a sheer blessing, delight and honour, Ajahn, to have you here. We're very <laughs> lucky as a Dhamma group because Ajahn doesn't teach to that many groups. He has a sort of uh, regular ones. So we're very, very fortunate. And uh, yeah, 
without me speaking any further, I shall hand over to you, Ajahn, for a Dhamma talk and guided meditation for the first session. Yay. Thank you. So we'll probably do about a 45 minute or 40 minute Dhamma talk and then toilet break and then guided meditation till um, 10 o'clock your time, six o'clock, six o'clock my time over here. But there is a title for the talk, which is Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And so often in life, and things never really go our way, then they always test us, test us out. But there's always something you can do, a positive attitude that this life is for learning, for growing, for investigating. And so whatever we happen to deal with in life, there's always something we can do. And I'm going to start off with a story uh, which most of them has to do with meditation, but to do with some of the other weird stuff which happens in life, which always interests me. And that was where over here in Perth, many years ago, uh, our local group were holding their 30th anniversary since forming. And that I was a boss monk at the time. And they asked me, he said, shall we have some sort of ceremony to celebrate our 30th anniversary? And I said, yeah, let's do it. And then they wanted to have a small little event. But my nature, I'm a Leo. I'm a Leo rabbit. So I said, if you're going to do anything, give it everything you've got. Make it something big and inspiring. And so we decided to let's make this happen. And so in Perth, where I live, there is this big central field called Supreme Court Gardens. And then we decided, let's just, let's just see if we can hire it for the day. And even though it was a Sunday, we wanted to hire it. Even though it was a full moon day, the Buddhists of Waisak, we decided, yeah, let's go for it. Let's hire it. And it was available. So we had the place and we just said to our committee, look, doesn't matter how much it costs. Let's just really go for it. Let's make a statement that good energy and meditation, Buddhism, truth has arrived in Australia. So you know, we had plenty of money sponsored and we had a big event for the day or actually for the evening was the event it was wayside day it was a real full moon day but in the morning when i woke up it was raining this was an outdoor event and it was worse than rain they told me on the weather forecast there is a uh, extreme weather event going to happen that evening. A storm is coming in from the Indian Ocean and will hit Perth just at the time that we we're going to start the ceremony. It was already raining. And of course, uh, being a monk, you always got to keep a positive attitude. Maybe it's because I was born in England and I wasn't afraid of rain, not like people here in Australia are. So I said, let's do it. And so we went out all day, putting up tents and a big golden Buddha statue, which we got from, from uh, Thailand, especially for the occasion. And it was raining and raining and raining all day. And it never stopped. And we'd invited our local premier, that's the head of the government of Western Australia. Three times his office called me, Ajahn Brahm, are you cancelling? I said, no, we're not cancelling. Three times they rang me. Uh, one of our members who was in the, in the uh, merchant navy, he took me aside and said, Ajahn Brahm, you're making a fool of yourself because I know the weather patterns. There's a huge storm coming. There's no way you can hold the ceremony. I said, we're going ahead. 
And even one of my monks, my old monks, he took me aside and said, Ajahn Brahm, you're embarrassing us all. Please cancel. No. So I was getting really wet and everyone was getting soaked as the rain poured down on this open air ceremony. And I was actually in one of the tents, one of the moments which I'll never forget for my life, when one of our hard workers ran in crying. And I thought, oh no, what else can go wrong? Someone broken their leg or some accident happened and they came in, they were crying and they just grabbed me and dragged me outside and just pointed up into the sky. It's, I'm telling this accurately with no exaggeration because in the sky, the clouds had parted for the first time all day. And in that party, you could see the full moon, the Waysack full moon, clear with no clouds. And I was really taken aback by that. There was a TV crew. The TV crew would come for the ceremony because our Premier of the state was attending and a few ambassadors. And the Premier was actually saying, so the, um, the TV presenter was saying, this is weird. This is weird. This is weird. And it was weird. We went through the whole ceremony and it did not rain. Later on that evening, just as the ceremony ended, it poured down with rain. The field got flooded. I don't know if I've ever seen it flooded before or after. The freeway close by was underwater and closed. The Riverside Drive was underwater. It was a huge storm. But it stopped. It stopped because we were doing something good and wonderful. A bit of chanting as well <laughs> helped. It was wonderful actually to see that. It was weird. And so weird that the following day, when the um, some of the organizers, especially the ones who were paying all the bills, uh, was received an email from the company director who was um, hiring out all the tents and electrical work and stages and stuff. And they said, we were amazed that you held that ceremony. We don't know how you did it. We never heard of Ajahn Brahm before, but could you please ask him who's going to win the horse racing today? <laughs> so, it kind of impressed people. Of course, you know, we're not interested in horse racing. But what we were interested in, in there is sometimes, you know, through the power of your mind, and it's for doing something really, really good or wonderful, sometimes you can make eyes in the center of storms. Even though you feel that the storm is a natural phenomenon, it happens. But why? But for the two hours we did our ceremony, it didn't rain. It had a little shower in the middle, but a tiny shower. And it impressed many people. Not so many people arrived for that ceremony because maybe three or four kilometers to the east, three or four kilometers to the west, three or four kilometers to the north and south, it poured down with rain and never stopped. But over our ceremony, it did stop for two hours, exactly when it was needed. It was, it's sort of impressive. And sometimes that it inspires myself to know just how the power of goodness, kindness, can help in so many parts of our life. We create the eyes in the center of storms with our positive mind. And that's actually what we try our very best to actually to generate. It's not just with meditation. It's not just with study. It's just with everything, just the, doing things which are good and wonderful and meaningful in life. I do often, you know, in the mornings, have a look at the news, see what's happening in this world. I have to do that. And I have to do that because following my teacher, I remember Ajahn Charles, one of his great monks, which was a monk called Ajahn Liam, still alive, 
And Ajahn Liam got very, very peaceful and very wise. Ajahn Chah ordered a newspaper for him and ordered him to read it every week or every day or something, I forget which, because he wanted a great monk, like a great nun, to also be able to relate to the world and understand as people's concerns. So we don't just get too far beyond relating to others. But with our Jen Liam, a story about him to show how he was so wise that he could, um, he could create eyes in the middle of the storms. It was at um, my teacher Ajahn Chah's funeral, you know, which I attended. I was you know, in Perth at the time when he died and when his cremation happened. That there, um, of course, I went over to, to attend. And many, many of those people who attended, they did all the ceremonies. But when actually the cremation happened at night time, many of them had disappeared. But anyway, I was there watching. And this monk, Ajahn Liam, had created this stupa. And with a very strong reinforced metal box inside the stupa, with a chimney, in which Ajahn Chah was supposed to be cremated. He spent a lot of money in creating this uh, crematorium to be used once and once only. And when it was lit, things started going very well until because of the heat uh, generated inside, the box started to crack and flames came out and smoke billowed out. And this was the cremation of, you know, your master, revered teacher, flames and it looked like, you no, know, it was for, for a while there, we thought the, the big stupa was gonna collapse. It was gonna be a disaster. But I always remember this monk, Ajahn Liam, you know, he put so much effort and time. He didn't just, you know, organize things. He was up there painting it, laying the concrete, doing everything. You know, the monks and nuns of this tradition we're really good value for money. <laughs> we do all that work for everybody. And anyway, it looked like it was a total disaster. And what this monk had General Liam did, I saw him and just wondered what he's gonna do next. He took one look at the disaster, turned around, went back to his hut and had a sleep. And he actually did that. He fell fast asleep afterwards. He didn't really worry whether it's going to be a disaster or a success. As it was, the other monks, including myself, put out the fire and you know, everything was okay. But the attitude when everything goes wrong and there's nothing you can do, well, you to give it everything you've got, wonderful. Now you can have a sleep and a rest, which you deserve to have. That impressed me that there was somebody who could give it everything you've got, but when it doesn't work, you let it go and have a rest. I don't know if you could do that, but when there's a storm, there's something you can do. Yes, see if you can sort of ease that storm, do something wonderful, be safe. But when there's nothing you can do, there we go. We can leave it alone. And that's how to rest and find peace in the eye of a storm. What it is, is changing one's attitude. Of course, there are times when we don't know whether it's the right time to work hard or the right time just to take a break. But most of the time we sort of can sense there's nothing can be done. So we should really be resting, relaxing, conserving our energies. And we don't know how to do that. We're so anxious and so worried. And this is, again, another little tale, which uh, I'm not telling tales which you can hear in um, or read in the, the Buddhist scriptures, because you can do that by yourself. These are little tales which I've, uh, I have accumulated, collected over my life. And this particular tale was from you know, when I was a school teacher. It just told me in the staff room of this high school in Devon, and told me by the English teacher at this high school. <coughs> and he told me that he was a, a soldier 
in the Second World War. He had been um, sent over to Burma. In the Second World War, just, you know, all men, you know, well, most men anyway, were drafted into the army. It was an all out war. So he wasn't a violent man. He wasn't a professional soldier. He was just an academic who had to go and join up and go in a war. And he was having to fight in, in Burma. And he wasn't violent, but it came to the, the, the time that when he was on a patrol in the jungle, now thousands of miles from home, not really knowing what to do, and on patrol with a few other soldiers, the scout came in and told them that they had wandered in to a huge number of Japanese troops. They were vastly outnumbered and completely surrounded. It's one of those times when you don't know if you're gonna live for a few more minutes or longer, but the odds are totally against you. But war in a foreign country, vastly outnumbered, no escape, get ready to die. And you know, he told me at the time that it's well known that nobody knows who is going to be the hero, if they're going to be any heroes at all. But you know, he, he thought, well, why not? Let's try and fight our way out. Who knows that maybe we can kill some of the enemy with us. Not a very kind thing to do. But the captain, the captain of this small group of soldiers said, no, we will not fight our way out. This is not some Hollywood block, blockbuster, you know, die hard or whatever it's called. There's no way out. So what should we do? And the captain ordered them all to sit down in the middle of the jungle, totally surrounded and about to die, sit down and have a cup of tea. The British Army, those traditions, <laughs> Those traditions were so strong. So if he thought it was just the craziest thing which he would ever do. Now, how can you think like that in the middle of a storm, about to die or be captured, killed, injured, to have a cup of tea? But orders are orders. You have to follow those orders. It's a war. And so he thought the stupidest thing to do, have a cup of tea. And while they were still drinking that tea, the scout came back and told everybody, put all the equipment away quickly and quietly. The enemy has moved. There's a way through. And of course, that's what they did. And every one of those soldiers escaped with no injuries. And he said he thanked that officer not once, but many times. He said later on in his life, uh, he developed a cancer and incurable, inoperable. So the doctor said to him, there's nothing he could do. And so he just took some time off work and relaxed, rested. And the cancer went into remission. When there's nothing to do, do nothing. And so often in life that some other forces are at work. Some kindness, the energy of the body heals itself. And there's so many, I've, so many times I've seen that happen in my life as a, as a monk, teaching people just to learn how to be quiet, to relax, to make peace with their body, and not to be anxious with their body, not to just get despairing with their body, to give it kindness, not trying to cure it. And those sorts of attitudes to the body just allow the body to generate its own healing power. You're seeing again, so, so, so many times. One of those examples, there's a fellow who came to see me over in Penang two or three years ago, and he had some weird condition in his brain. And the weird condition you know, was quite painful, but you know, it would cause his death within a year or two. And the, there were some doctors in Singapore who knew sort of how to, to deal with it. There's only two or three cases in the world. 
And it was a very, very painful operation because he went through with it and killed himself. And they gave him the all clear. But then after another couple of years, it came back and returned. And then he knew exactly what he was facing, a very painful operation and you know, very you know, uncertain whether it would heal it or not heal it or whether he would have to go for further surgery. And it's very expensive as well. But he had, in that meantime, he'd got married and his wife was pregnant with a child. And it was you know, for his child and of course his wife, they decided to have the operation again. So sent down over to Singapore from Penang. And then as doctors always do, they took the, the scan, said, yeah, you know, we have to operate in a couple of days. Prepared him, got himself all ready. And then on the day of the operation, they gave him another scan. And they informed him that uh, something wrong with the machine. We have to retake the scan. If ever that happens to you, you go to see a doctor and say, we have to retake the scan. Get excited. Nothing wrong with the machine. Everything was wrong with their theories. Because the brain had wired itself in those two days. It was not a problem anymore. And they told him, so, it's okay. You don't need to have the operation. You can go home. I don't know how this has happened, but it's clear that your brain has rewired itself and you're fine. I know that story because he came to tell me it with a lot of gratitude. So I taught him how to do that little operation in his own head, that little mindfulness and kindness and softness to allow, it's not to heal your own body, but to allow your body to heal itself. So two different things. You don't try and get rid of the disease. You don't try and mend the tears or untangle the mess in the brain. You learn just how to leave it alone and instead give this beautiful kindness. The door of my heart is always open to you, which is not an aggressive or assertive action, but something which is far more powerful, beautiful act of love and kindness to your own brain, not for the purpose of healing, just for the purpose of giving that love and kindness to your own brain. And you know, he was just one happy person when he left. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So many times you've seen these, these and they're not miracles. They're just the nature of the body, which you know, we don't really understand that much. And we're so anxious or scared to allow to happen. So that story of that man, my fellow school teacher in the middle of the jungle encapsulates it so beautifully. But when there's nothing to do, we learn how to do nothing. If there is something to do, we give it everything we've got. And actually learning how to do nothing, that's the, the hard one. Now as Westerners, as, I can't say Westerners anymore, can I? They're just, People from all over the world just come on these talks. It's supposed to be Westerners, I suppose, in the UK, but I mean, does that really, really mean anything, a Westerner? There's human beings. Just you know, sometimes we do have these problems in our life. And we've learned to solve problems by going for it, attacking it, really putting some, some effort into researching it, doing things, changing our lifestyles, exercising, all this other stuff which we do, which is all good. But there's some things which are also important. There's changing the attitudes of our mind. There's a storm going on. And the storm is very violent. And the storm is just very dangerous. How do we react? Does worrying help? Does being anxious save your life? Or does being afraid get you out of that problem? If that was the case, then those uh, soldiers would be much better to be anxious and just, I don't know, run away or just, you know, try and fight. Someone might get through, who knows? But no, they were much wiser than that. They were still. 
peaceful and waited until there was something they could do. When they could be effective, they took that chance and off they went. And quite frankly, in my own life, sometimes people don't realize just how hard and much work a nun or a monk has to do in this world. And I've been had a very quite a busy day, to, I said busy week, no, not a busy week, a busy year. Now I always thought that COVID would be wonderful. Now, not I mean not for people to get COVID, but you know, for be able to just have a break, wouldn't have to travel so much. I can do some more retreats. <laughs> Instead, what happened? There's, there's so many more of these, which I'm doing now, Zoom retreats all over the world. Last weekend, just Zoom retreat after Zoom retreat, Zoom talk after Zoom talk. And what day is it today? It's the Thursday for me, doing all sorts of stuff in the meantime. So life as a Buddhist monk and a Buddhist nun is very busy. You just ask Venerable Chanda how hard she works. I don't think anybody works that hard you know, in corporate life. We have to do that. Why? Out of kindness, out of care. There's sometimes that people say, oh, Ajahn Brahm, you're a Theravada monk. You're supposed to be in it for your own enlightenment. You know, if you really want to sacrifice yourself for others, you should be Mahayana, the Bodhisattva path. And I have known many, many, many uh, Mahayana nuns and monks, and Tibetan uh, nuns and monks. My goodness. <laughs> I know I, and certainly Phil Chanda, we work harder than any of those. So being a Theravada is not about selfishness at all. We let go of the self. We don't have one. Which means we give and give and give and give out of kindness. So we work very, very hard. But it's not just hard work. The idea of the meditation, finding the calm in the eye of the storm of service, it's like learning how to create those eyes in the middle of the storm, those places of serenity and peace, which are always there no matter how busy you are. It's learning how to, I often call it, grant yourself moments of peace. No one else will give you those moments of peace. It's up for you, to you, to give that to yourself. If any of you have read that book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, in the beginning of that book, I just wrote down a couple of poems. And I think one poem especially. There was an old Chinese, um, a translation of a Chinese a poem which really inspired me so many years ago. I think even when I was a student, I had that written down. And it started with, grant yourself a moment of peace and you'll realize how foolishly you've scurried about. We always feel we justify our busyness. And it's important. We're not kind, kindly busy. We're not wise busy. Instead, we get ourselves tired out. So we sometimes grant ourselves moments of peace. And as Buddhist practitioners, we try and do that every day. This is a time I'm going to give myself. It's like a grant, it's a gift. Like you get it from the government, you get it from your family, your friends, whoever, your boss. You work very hard, take a day off. You do that to yourself. Grant yourself a moment of peace. It doesn't say the whole day, it says a moment of peace. And you realize how foolishly you scurried about, running here, running there, when you never needed to do that. At the time, it feels we have to, but it really wasn't that necessary. We do have the possibilities for those calm in the eye of the storm, but it's not that we wait for it to happen. It's not we really strive for it to happen. We give it to ourselves as a grant, as a gift. Take a time off. And of course, straight away, the people start to complain. I haven't got the time to take a rest. There's so many things I have to do. I remember telling this to 
I don't know if she's here or listening, but there was a nurse, no, sorry, not a nurse, a doctor on duty in Spain in the COVID clinics. And then she told me just how incredibly busy she was. I mean, doing like 20 hour days or something. And, you know, that's just incredible. But, you know, there's people just coming up all the time. They were dying. She could help. How could she think of sleep? But even on top of that, she had kids at home who never saw her during this time. And she had so much, you know, obviously, disappointment and stress doing this incredible work for COVID. And, you know, it was even worse sometimes when she said that some people would come to the, the hospital and she had to make choices. You know, who could get the treatment, who couldn't? And you know, she had some uh, ways of judging people which you know, were given to her by the her bosses. But it was terrible to send somebody home with painkillers, morphine or something, knowing that they would not survive. Others, they can come in the hospital and they would survive. And she had to make the choice between the two. And it's incredible mental stress. And that's what I said you know, to her, Madam, you do an incredible job, amazing, wonderful job, but you're missing out one thing. And that is to grant yourself moments of peace. But I don't have that time. I said, of course you do. This is how to do it and how to understand it and justify it. And I gave this simile, first of all, so many years ago now. I remember one of the times I gave this simile and it really took off. It was at a, a computer conference. I think it was the, uh, the local World Computer Conference um, event over in Brisbane many years ago. And I must admit that being a an old monk now, that you get invited to conferences and stuff, and you know, that's a bit boring. You know, I've done that so many times. But when you get an interesting invitation, which you've never done before, then I think, wow, that is interesting. I'm going to try that one out. Unfortunately, that one of those ones which I missed out on, were it was in um, Sydney, Australia, just a couple of years, ago, just the start of COVID. And it was going to be held on, um, what's it called, Halloween's night. And it was like a, a real Ghostbusters conference. Because you know that's one of the things we do as monks. We go out to houses and bust ghosts. And then we bust them, they just give them kindness and settle them down to make sure they don't cause any trouble for anybody. But this was like going to have a conference about this and it was going to be on Halloween's night. And in Sydney, so yeah, I'm up for that. <laughs> It'd be an interesting thing to do. But this particular um, conference was on World Computer Conference. And as I know that all of the friends who know me, that I'm not all that good on computers these days. Anything which goes wrong, I get the younger monks to come in and they fix it all up. But nevertheless, I thought, yeah, let's go for this. So I went there and that was one of the first times I told them a very old story, but it's a beautiful story. And you can please share this with others so people don't get so stressed out in their work. How heavy is my cup of water? I'm sure you've all seen this before, but it's a beautiful simile. How heavy is my cup of water? You know that I've been holding it for maybe about 30 seconds now. It starts to feel heavy. The longer I hold it, the heavier it feels. I remember I, I must have done this with uh, Edward Chandler once because I gave this simile at Imperial College, the Buddhist Society in Imperial College in London. And when I hold this up and ask, I should have known better, how heavy is this cup of water which I was holding? And then some smart Alex said, well, about 360 grams <laughs> or something like that. They'd worked it out. Oh, come on, that's not what I mean. It's not actually how heavy it is, but how heavy it feels. And then they got the message, the longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. And there comes a time when this you know, mug of water, it is actually water and not tea today. This mug of water soon will get so heavy, it's really uncomfortable to hold. What should I do? 
And of course, you all say, because you know, you're just not doing it yourself, it's obvious to you, put it down and rest. And you can try it at home. If you haven't done this yet, put it down for a minute. When you pick it up again, you know, even after 20 seconds, it feels much lighter. It really does, because your arm has rested. And the meaning of that simile is that when you're working, really struggling with the work which you do for your employers, when you're working for yourself, you're working, making sure an Kampa Bikuni project is successful, which it's going to be anyway, but it still needs a lot of work. Whatever you're doing in your life, grant yourself moments of peace. Learn how to put down the, the burden of these things which you really have to do. Take a break. Because then what happens? Your brain, your mind, your cognitive faculties take a break. And then when they rest, yes, it's about 15 minutes of doing nothing, 15 minutes of, of not being productive at all. But after those 15 minutes, you go back to work. You go back to you know, receive all those patients who are dying with COVID. And they come into your hospital and you, you're the, the, the doctor or the nurse. If you've rested for 15 minutes, you will find you're much more clear. Your awareness, your ability to be perceptive and also innovative is increased. You try that. I used to notice that when I was tired and just working on, on um, emails or writing some articles or something, when I was tired, it made a, did a terrible job. And it took so much time. You couldn't figure out the words or the sentences. But when you rested, gave yourself moments of peace. And when you went back to that computer screen or that notepad, you could write things down so easily. Not just easily, but high quality. And for those of you who were at the uh, Anukampa Bikuni Project Volunteers Meeting last week, I did show you some, some of the manuscripts which I'd written out by hand. And you know, because it just came to my mind and the manuscript was you know, quite close by, I, I showed it to all those volunteers. And I look at it myself, it provides me inspiration simply because that was the original manuscript of opening the door of your heart, the first door of the two bad bricks in the war. And I look at that, I just wrote it out. It was that and a couple of other stories, one hour. I did one hour every day for 15 days, and that was half that book. It never needed to be edited. The handwriting was perfect. You don't need to have any spell checks or cross out a word and find a better word. It just flowed seamlessly, effortlessly, you know, from my mind onto that piece of paper, just writing it out by hand. It was like a meditation in itself. And I see that just how powerful that was to be able to just to do that because my mind was really rested. We knew the right words and was innovative and clear. So sometimes I use those just to remind myself of the power of granting yourself moments of peace. What comes out afterwards is of really high quality. So little by little, you know, one understands that this is worthwhile to give yourself moments of peace. And of course, the next question is in the eye of the storm, how can we find that peace? You know, you have to be innovative, even finding peace, but I told this nurse so that, look, there's, there's a place in the hospital where you can go. It's called the restroom. I prefer the American term. In the, Amer in the restroom, Let's go in the restroom. You still got your gear on, your protective clothing on. Don't need to take it off. It just takes too much time because you have to put it on again afterwards. Sit down in one of the cubicles, lock the door and stay there. You stay there for 15 minutes. Not to evacuate your bowels or your bladder, but just to relax. 
is to learn some of these places which we have in our world where we can be peaceful. If you're worried about noise of people next to you, get some earbuds or something where you can really relax. If you really think that giving yourself moments of peace is important, it's easy to find those places. Many, many, many years ago, <laughs> one of these people, he was, say, uh, a doctor. Oh, sorry, he was not a doctor. He was a lawyer in New York. And I remember his story is such a long time ago now, but he was a lawyer on criminal cases where if he got it wrong, his client would be given an electric chair. That's pretty stressful. Now you're defending a client, and if you get it wrong, they're executed. So anyway, that's a high stress job. But you no, know, he learned how to meditate. And together with his secretary, they needed a place to meditate in the office. And in the office, you always have a cupboard somewhere. And so he cleared out the cupboard with the secretary. And that's where he sits every day for half an hour at lunchtime. And his secretary forces him into that cupboard sometimes. <laughs> because his secretary knows he's a much nicer boss in the afternoon after he's meditated. He's so tense and, and aggressive if he hasn't had a rest. And so they put him in the, the cupboard. And I remember the secretary saying that when anybody calls, I, mean, I need to speak to him, I need to speak to him. She said, I'm sorry, he's in his cupboard. <laughs> Which I thought was a wonderful way of saying not available. He's at a meeting or he's you know, not free right now. He's in his cupboard. And people realize just how important that is. He's a much better person afterwards. So you need to grant yourself those moments of peace and be innovative to find places where you can have that peace. Another couple of uh, disciples here, followers over in Perth, a young couple. And they had a couple of kids, maybe about six years of age, four years of age, the younger girl was four. <coughs> Sorry. And they needed to find a nice place to meditate in their little house. What they found was a little um, underneath the stairs. This is way before Harry Potter. They cleaned out the place under the stairs and that's where they made a meditation room. And they would go in there regularly when they wanted some peace and quiet, they went in there underneath the stairs and to meditate in a small little house. But the Amazing thing which happened was that the children weren't allowed in there because they thought the children didn't know what meditation was. But then what happened one day, they were just busy in the house and the two kids were playing outside. And the older brother, six years of age, hit his sister. You know how children play and sometimes they tease one another. And he hit her and she burst out crying. And then she ran into the house and into the place under the stairs and sat quietly there. And the two parents were just totally gobsmacked, totally amazed that the child knew the safest place in the house, simply because that was a place which they used to create peace and stillness. And this is one of the reasons why when you grant yourself moments of peace and places where you can find that peace, you create your little havens in the eye of a storm. Many people have places in their house, panic rooms or underground shelters in case of some nuclear attack or whatever, I'm not sure. But why don't we have places in our house, in our companies, in wherever we go, where we can let go? Places where we can grant ourselves is so important moments of peace for our health and our ability to be um, innovative and clear in our work. So whenever we are that tired, we have something to do. Whenever there's a storm in our life, in our body, in our mind, in our community, we have the refuge. We know how to use it. Okay. Please excuse me for talking a lot. That is my nature. 
I've told many of you in the past that when you get old, your legs are no good, your arms are weak, your eyes need glasses, your ears aren't so good. But I've always told everybody that the one part of your body which grows stronger with every year of your age is your mouth. <laughs> so I'm almost 70 now, so my mouth is pretty strong and it's getting stronger with every year. So please excuse me for talking too much. Now we can do a little five or 10 minutes um, toilet break or should we just go straight to meditation in general? Straight to meditation. Okay. So I'm teaching the meditation just to forget about all of the pressure in your tummy and bowels and all of the pressure in your bladder. So you Maybe two see. minutes, Ajahn. We can give them two minutes perhaps. Two minutes to go to the toilet, that's not that long. Okay, on your marks, get set, <laughs> go. <laughs> toilet break. A couple of minutes. Oh, do do. Because it's warm here in Australia, you don't need to go to the toilet so often. A lot of times you, um, the amount of liquid going from your pores is just uh, more than enough. You don't need to go to the toilet so often. Oh, I can see one of the video hosts there. Is that Mel or whatever? They got a picture of the stupor at Jana Grove. The stupor at Jana Grove video host is this one. Yes, sir, Jan, it is. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's beautiful. That reminds me of a beautiful stupor which was offered from one of the great monks in, in uh, Jakarta. But you've got to be careful if you visit that stupa, either in Jogjakarta or in Jhana Grove, where I live, because there's an old tradition, because inside that stupa, there is a Buddha statue, very beautiful Buddha statues. But the, the tradition is, if you can reach inside, and if you can touch that Buddha statue with your hand, then you will find true love. <laughs> And so any monks or nuns visiting, I'm always watching you, <laughs> making sure you don't put your hand inside that. <laughs> of course, it doesn't work. Unless you understand what true love really means. And true love is opening the door of your heart, no matter what, not owning people, not trying to possess people or wanting anything from them, but just wanting to care and give for anybody true, unbounded kindness. Okay, how are we going? Okie dokie. So there's a few empty places in there. But anyway, let's get started. So now this is important. This is actually learning just how to grant yourself a moment of peace. You want to, you have the situation now we learn how to feel that peace and let it grow and don't disturb it when it's growing so often in life we we just okay here we go um you can't see there's still some water in my cup here and quite often i've done this when i've been on a retreat in say in england and i asked somebody said is the water in this cup still yet and they look at it and it's not still at all and i said that the reason why it's not still is i'm not looking at it i'm not being aware so then i use my mindfulness awareness to be to watch this cup it's still moving because i'm not focusing i'm not concentrating i'm not concentrating on the cup 
doesn't matter how long I concentrate on this cup to try and keep it motionless. The water is always moving. It's the nature of the muscles in a hand and an arm, they always are, are moving. It's impossible to hold a cup of water perfectly still. It's impossible to hold it still. And then I put it down. I let it go, rest it on the table. And resting on the table, not holding it. And I look at it. You can see from the reflections of the, of the light, that water is not moving at all now. It's perfectly still when you let it go. That's actually how we meditate. Sometimes people, so you put it down, is it stopped moving yet? Oh no, no, it's still, give it a bit longer, is it stopped moving yet? No, stop interfering with the process. Your job is just to be the silent, motionless, non-interfering observer. Let's see what happens. Okay, so that's the instructions and I'll give a guided meditation for half an hour. Just know to start things off today. So you close your eyes. And just say to yourself in your own words, this is a time which I give for meditation. This is all my like sacred time for you. It's not correct to use this half an hour for planning, for thinking, for writing your biography or getting some some deep thoughts about the nature of reality. Don't waste your time on that. This is for stillness, peace. So when you tell your mind that the purpose of what you're going to do for the next half an hour, it helps point your mind in the right direction. And then in order to create the opportunity for peace to grow in your mind, we do actually have to look after our body first of all. So how are your legs right now? I ask my legs, I care for my legs. I've developed an attitude to look at my legs as not my possessions, but my friends. I never mistreat a good friend. So legs, my good friend, my legs, how are you? And can I just arrange things so you're more comfortable? When I care for my legs, they give me the answers and they need to be adjusted. And I always follow their advice. They know more about how to be comfortable than my theories and dogma do. Well, once my legs are comfortable, then I move up to my butt. I do spend special attention on my butt simply because too often in meditation, in the old days, I had to move because my butt was killing me. It was just so sore. I hadn't put it in a good position to begin with. I don't know about you, but more than anything else in my body, it's my butt. I must have butt karma, I don't know. So I make sure my bottom is really comfortable. And of course, that's connected to my waist and my back. And I do a little stretch. Once I'm stretched, I relax to the max. I let go. I don't hold things. I put things down. And I can feel the back change its, its sensations. It starts to feel more relaxed. If you do this often, you soon become very sensitive to what is relaxation and what is stress. 
Stress is when you're pulling something or squashing it. Relaxation is loose and easy. And then I go to the front of my body. The front of the body is my intestines and colon and stomach. I make sure that that's really comfortable. Still, believe it or not, I can still feel the food which I had for lunch today. It hasn't totally digested yet, but this is fine. Your lungs and your heart and any organ in inside of you. You don't even know to know which one it is or what name it is. As you move your awareness up your body, there's anything inside of you which feels it needs some kindness. Pause there. Pause there and it may be, ah, oh, maybe my top of my colon. I feel there's a little bit of irritation there because of the food. I just focus on it, zoom in on it. Like on things like Google Maps, you zoom in. And as you zoom in, Everything else falls off the screen. And you give it your love. For me, my colon. May you be happy and well. I care for you. You know that sometimes, <laughs> like this time, suddenly just give it some kindness and the, any tightness and tension just vanishes. When tightness and tension vanishes, the energy this moves through the system as it should be doing. There's no blockage. You can feel that in your own body. That's how it can be healed. That's what I told that fellow who had the, the brain condition. Just care for that part of your body. Really to the max. And then just straighten itself out. Not theory, because that was on the CT scans. And then, once that part of your body is relaxed, just you can move to other parts of the body until eventually you come to your shoulders and relax those. Making sure those muscles aren't pulled apart or squashed. And one way of relaxing shoulders is the counterintuitive, scrunching them up, scrunching them up really tight scrunched up as you can and then let go. And they all, always end up more relaxed than when I started. Go down your arms. Anything there which is needs some attention, just pause, zoom in, zap it with kindness. And when it relaxes, move on. To your hands. How are your hands positioned now? And if your person is very tense because you know, maybe that doctor, you can feel your body does need some attention. You've ignored it to help others' bodies and weakened your own ability to assist and help. So now is the time for your own body. You do it really carefully, not thinking about what happened in the past or who's going to be in front of you later on in front of yourself. You treat others like you would treat yourself, treat yourself like you treat others with care, and relaxation. And you go back up to your neck, making sure that your head is well balanced on top of the neck. Doing everything you can to relieve any tightness or tension anywhere in your body. And then lastly to your face. In your face. I always love this doing this last of all because it's not dealing with physical stuff now, it's dealing with emotional stuff because any pressure, tightness around your eyes or mouth or nose or head, so much of that is caused by negative emotions. Feels like anxiety, fear, negativity. That screws up your face. So I 
feel the, the muscles, which I'm doing right now, feeling the muscles around my eyes. I know those feelings very well. It's been a lot of time together in the past. Every time I meditate, I look at you. Now relax you. I figured out how to relax the muscles around the eyes because I can feel them. They, they're getting less tight around the forehead, around the mouth. Relaxing them very deeply. Sometimes you do trial and error. You do something and then it gets tighter. You do something different and it relaxes. You feel it. That's how we learn how to relax the muscles in our face. And with it, some of the emotional problems played out on our face. And then I feel my whole body just sitting here. One unit from the top of the head to the toes of the feet. If there's something I missed out anywhere in my body, I'll just zoom in on that. Relax it to the max. I care for my body. It's a combination of mindfulness and kindness. Because it becomes delightful, pleasurable, the awareness of my body when it's relaxed. My mind doesn't wander off anywhere. You see, with this body, there's quite a large degree of mindfulness and loving kindness as well. The more loving kindness and awareness I have of my own body, the awareness knows what's going on in it. The kindness relaxes it so deeply. And the delight is also part of my awareness now. The delight allows the relaxation to go so strong and so deep. I love this part of meditation, well, actually all parts of meditation, this is when it starts to really get cool and joyful. With me with my body, relaxed very deeply. Of course, this is great health. You're going inside, inside the storm of life, inside your body, inside that into your mind. And you don't need to be a philosopher to know what the mind is. Just keep it simple, peaceometer, like a speedometer, thermometer. How peaceful are you now? Number from one to ten. One really peaceful, ten really agitated. Don't give it sort of some value judgments, just be honest. Because once you're looking at the peace in your mind, just like you look at relaxation in your body, you soon find the cause of peace or the cause of agitation. One of the most skillful, powerful ways to be peaceful is present moment awareness. It's not that hard to let go of the past. It's a burden and it's unchangeable. You don't learn from the past. That's a myth, learning from the past. You torture yourself with the past. You learn from the present moment. This present moment is more real than the past. And you learn so much more from being here right now than you ever learn from the past. Now as for your future, all the plans and things you feel like you need to do, 
your future is being made right now. So stay in this moment. You'll find the future will be wonderful for you. That's the best thing you can possibly do, I found, for your future. Just spend more time now. Especially in meditation, because this is learning how to rest. Restore the energies of a tired mind and an exhausted heart. Human beings are so kind, so good, but they're just too tired. And give that kindness to yourself. If you're tired, be tired. Care for what you feel. Don't try and cure it. It's an awareness and kindness. Opening the door of your heart, especially the door of your mindfulness. For what's happening right now? No plans. No value judgments. Just knowing. With the kindness of a mother to her only child. I'm going to be quiet for five minutes. If you want to go to your breath, fine. Most importantly, enjoy peace. I'll be quiet for five minutes.
Really close to the end of the meditation bell. How do you feel? What are you aware of right now? How peaceful is it? How still is your mind? The more still, the stronger is the mindfulness. The stronger the mindfulness, the more joy. Peace is delightful. How does your body feel now? You move from inside outwards to your body. We're looking after it to begin with, and going inside to the mind. You come back out to your body again. It's usually very, very relaxed. It feels good. When you're ready, you may open your eyes. For those of you who are fortunate, you don't have to do very much. You can always carry on meditating, or after I stop speaking, just close your eyes and do more. This is many time zones on this retreat, so we try and work in with whatever we have. Yeah, eating today and just uh, rest, walk meditation, sit meditation. Make the most use of today. And later on, when we come back, it is a guided, another guided meditation and then a Q&A. If any important questions, please ask them. And I'll do my best to give those answers. Okay, then we'll turn down. What have you got? Yes. Thank you, Ajahn Bam. I would like to uh, thank you for the morning and release you into your other duties, which are hopefully a bit lighter than <laughs> you might expect. Um, and I will just give a few minutes of, guide, of walking meditation instruction for those who wish to stay for that. Otherwise, if anybody wishes to leave the session now, we will close the Zoom um, during the lunch break. So you have to sign back in again at quarter past 12 UK time. So say if you can come, you know, 10, 15 minutes before the next session starts, however that works in your time zone. But for those who wish to stay on for 10 minutes now, I'll give some uh, walking meditation instructions and a little bit of advice for the in-between period. So yes, I'll let you go, Ajahn. And, okay, thank and we'll you. We'll see you for, back here. For giving me the opportunity to serve. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. So great. So the walking meditation is a really nice way to. Take whatever peace you've developed in your heart through sitting into a slightly more active posture. And it can be a really nice way of integrating practice with daily life. Because obviously in daily life, we have our eyes open, you know, we move between one room and the next or, you know, one place and the next. And sometimes these are the times that we can forget to connect with ourselves and forget that peace that can be accessed inside at any time. So the walking meditation is um, not only a nice <clears throat> practice to do during retreat, but it can also help for you to develop more mindfulness in your daily life. So I would suggest having a go at that for the next half hour or so, because we have uh, we have two and a half hours or two, two hours and 15 minutes before uh, the next session. So just see if you can keep some of that peace inside and also notice what happens when you do start to change the posture. Notice the way the sensors get 
um, pulled outside? What is it that's you know, dragging your attention? And what are your responses to the sights and sounds, maybe other people who you have to see if you do have to meet anybody? So just notice the impact of that and see if you can guard your senses so that wholesome states can keep on developing in your mind. And if you notice you're reacting in, an, in negative ways or ways that are bringing about suffering for you, then just see if you can you know, change your perceptions, soften your perceptions and <clears throat> gently incline your mind back towards peace. So for the walking meditation, for those who would like to try, you'll just need to find um, an area which is maybe, depending on the size of your house, um, the length of a room, perhaps seven steps, perhaps 10 steps. And the steps that you take will be a little bit smaller, perhaps slower than your normal walking pace. So you stand at one side of the room and just settle yourself in your body. You know, maybe close your eyes, feel the weight of the feet on the ground and notice the intention to start to move. So noticing your foot, how it starts to move, uh, which part of the foot leaves the ground first, what are the different sensations, the changing sensations in your feet? Maybe pressure, weight, maybe texture, perhaps coolness, warmth. And then just lifting that foot. So I'll do it with my hand. So you just lift and gradually experience the foot off the ground. And then notice how it moves and then gradually comes back down. Which part of the foot touches the ground first? And again, how does it feel? when you put the weight back in that foot, which parts of the foot take the weight first? And then you put your attention in the next foot. So keeping your awareness, keeping your mindfulness with whichever parts of the body are moving. And if you find at any time that it's becoming a bit narrow, your awareness is a bit contracted and your mind's becoming tense, you may want to just gently open out the mind, perhaps to include more of the foot or even the whole leg. So it doesn't really matter. But the whole idea is just to keep on settling the mind, bringing the mind into the body. So see what works for you. And again, when you get to the end of one stretch, pause again, because it's somewhere in the middle of that um, walking path that the mind tends to wander. You know, you might have a thought arising about lunch and what you're going to cook and how you desperately need to get to the kitchen much sooner than you originally thought you did. <laughs> so this is in the middle of the path. So when you get to the end of the path, pausing, pausing at that point, standing and then mindfully turning around, hmm? pausing again before starting your walk at the other end of the path. So with every step, we're aiming to arrive rather than to get the, to the next step. Just as with every breath, we aim to be present rather than thinking about the next breath to come. And also, if you do have nice weather where you are, you are free to try the walking meditation outdoors. This can also be very nice. And nature tends to be quite have a soothing and calming or even energizing effect on the mind. I think the sounds of nature, you know, the sights of the trees and the birds isn't a negative sense input. It's actually quite a soothing, quite a complementary um, input to the practice because it's nature, it's natural. So it connects us to life. It connects us to our bodies and our place in the world. So there's a few suggestions for the walking meditation. And uh, I suggest we stop the video and then I can actually ask if there are any questions or, or um, that you might have around that.